Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be, hey, just in time. You're actually you're a minute late. Lumbar discectomy. So um, we're going to go through an illustrative case, and then we're going to go over the imaging, and then we're also going to watch the surgery. So it's kind of all together. So it's a 39-year-old woman with pain in her right buttock, her right posterior thigh, and with radiation to the right dorsum of her foot, right second and third toes. And you can see on the right, she's a relatively young woman. Anybody younger than me is young, that's the definition, right? She's a relatively young woman. And on the right, you can see her pain diagram. Um, over the last, so uh, Katie, when, you, when somebody tells you posterior buttock, posterior leg, dorsum of the foot, what nerve root? Do you have a nerve root in mind? L1? L4, L5. Yeah, L5, yeah. top of the foot. So these, these symptoms started two months ago, and they started as intermittent. And then one month ago, the pain was constant. She also has pain and numbness. She's tried uh, chiropractic care. Uh, it's worse when she sits, and she has failed non-steroidals. She has had low back pain in the past, uh, but otherwise she's healthy. And she does have some numbness when her th where her thigh meets her groin. And you can see her uh, VAS, visual analog scale, she puts it around 6.7 out of 10. So, um, any questions so far? So, he healthy woman. So, um, I can just tell you what I use for history is, I mean, I see many people, obviously, and um, let's, say, let's say a patient comes and says, Sci severe sciatica for one week. Do you send them to the surgeon, Katie? No, because sometimes it gets better, right? But this woman's now two months. And the key is, like the, I have in the slide, getting better and better. I, I mean, this is why I think the most important thing for me is, are you getting better? So if, it's, if the patient is getting better, give it some time. And two months is not too long. Would you have a rule of thumb, uh, Walter? Yeah, 18 is about on the same. Uh, eight to 12 weeks. Eight to 12 weeks, uh, two, three months. These things usually get better within, I mean, statistically, six months is where they get it. But somebody who's uncomfortable rarely lasts that long. Yeah, you can't have, you can't have you people really torture. Like, yeah. yeah. Pain is uh, pervasive. So you have to wait to drill to your, your patients pretty quick. So usually eight to twelve weeks is my 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 uh, uh, when I see them in the office because we, we as, call them as long as they're reasonable right as yeah. long as they're not miserable I, I have them uh, every four weeks I evaluate them just to see if there is an inner road to decline and as long as they're going in the right direction like that we'll continue with a just clinical observation and conservative yeah yeah so I the same thing is just as long as they're as long as they're getting better give it more time. But she's not getting better. She's getting worse. So um, this is uh, this is just one thing is m many people use is the seek sign is that when you move somebody's leg, the nerve moves in the nerve moves as well because the nerve's in the leg. And then when the nerve moves over the disc, it causes pain. So when you can you can extend the uh, knee in the sitting position, that can cause pain. Or you can extend the knee when they're sitting at the side of the table, that can cause pain. Or you can dorsiflex the ankle, that can cause pain too. And if, uh, and, and that basically is a corresponding uh, physical examination sign for people with a disc herniation. So the non-operative treatments are, uh, I mean, you can give steroid packs, non-steroidals, muscle relaxers, opiates, uh, other medications like neuroleptics, like gabapentin, physical therapy, chiropractic care, massage, acupuncture, injections. Did I miss anything? Walter, yeah. What's your go-to? Let's say your best friend comes to you, uh, and uh, he's uh, 50 years old, and he has sciatica for seven days. What's your go-to treatment? He a healthy person. He be healthy. And let's say if he has a pain level at the five over ten. I usually try an anti-inflammatory medication and activity modification. So you like Celebrex, right? I like Celebrex or Malaxi you know. And uh, if they have intense pain, we save them pain with that, uh, you see them posturing because they have neural tension, I'll, I'll give them a shot of steroids. And I usually, in six days, I, in three days, actually, I've 
but that that's my go to. Okay, so the MRI scan shows some retrolysthesis at L5S1, decreased signal at L5S1, a disc herniation at L5S1. This is L4, L5, so this is an open magnet study, so low resolution. So this is an axial cut, and you can see the spinal canal is open. But at, at 5.1, there's a large, really central disc herniation, but more on the right. Um so um, the other, the other uh, concern is the numbness where her thigh meets her groin. So is that called a chronic syndrome? What do you think, Katie? Um, it's, it's close to it, but we'd have to ask her. It's not, right? So caught a chronic syndrome, it's a man-made, we made this up, not God, but we made this up. It's numbness of the perineal anesthesia, saddle anesthesia, um, severe back and leg pain, and right. bowel and bladder problems, right? Mm -hmm. So she doesn't need all that, but it's of concern. Right, so we'd have to ask her the other questions just so that we can deny those. Yeah, and the other problem I personally have is when someone has a numb perineum, they can't feel having sex. It's a big problem. So uh, personally, if someone has a numb perineum, I do the surgery because if you're left with a perineal anesthesia, it's a serious, serious problem for the person. Yeah. Uh, unless you're 100 years old or something. So personally, I take those patients very, very serious and assume they're going to progress. Okay. So anything you want to add, Walter? Yeah. Usually, I usually ask them, you know, do you feel yourself when you're white in your shirt? Because they know this. Yeah. So, you know, they, they link themselves. And they're not going to tell you they unless you ask. You, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I leave myself right here, you know, and so all my do you feel yourself? Do you feel yourself? And they, they usually they, they tell you. Nobody asked, doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one's, no one's going to. It's embarrassing to tell, actually, you still sew it on your underpants, specifically when you're an adult. Yeah, no one's going to tell you that. So you have to ask. It's, a, it's, a, it's embarrassing, but you have to ask. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly. This is just some cartoons. So the, I think of the spine as a cube, as a block, like a building block for a child. And if you. Stack all the blocks all the way up. It's a spine, basically. It's a big column. At each level, of, at each block, a nerve comes out. Now, we're going to just focus on the lumbar spine because that's today's case. And the nerves run down the legs. Now, so this is a side view. And you can see the nerves, they run down the back of the leg. And that nerve is called sciatic, the sciatic nerve. And pain along that distribution is sciatica. And it, and it can be extremely painful. At each block, there's nerves that exit the spinal canal, and there's discs. So I'll be quick. I know it's a little boring, but I feel I want to explain things. You like the drawings? Yeah. <laughs> the drawings help you understand, you know? So almost, you know, vertebrates have spines, and this is a, a raccoon spine. Most quadrupeds have uh, kyphosis in the lumbar spine. So we're as humans, we're unique that we have lordosis in the lumbar spine, and that's why we can stand on two feet and use our hands. But that's that's not the norm in the animal kingdom. And personally, I think that's why L4, L5, S1 gets all the genetic disc disease, because we have lordosis. But most spines are kyphotic. So the functions of the spine, basically, uh, it transmits force um, to the pelvis, the upper body to the pelvis, and also range of motion. You have flexion, extension, bending, and rotation. Um, when you're a child, this is an 18-year-old girl from GW. And, uh, I used to cover the gymnastics, and I was incredible. I was amazed at how flexible she was. So when you're the children are always very, very flexible, but as you get older, uh, most people lose all their flexibility. Most people. So this is a normal disc. <clears throat> The disc in the middle is gelatinous and water-filled. On the outer part, it's very thick and ligamentous. The disc uh, has a cartilaginous end plate, and you can see the apophyseal ring, the circle. Uh, that's where children grow, teenagers grow. So that's the growth plate. The disc itself does not have blood supply. So you can see the top is the annulus, the nucleus pulposus. Then there's a cartilage in the middle. You see the cartilage, the end plate. And then there's bone, and the blood vessels are at the junction of the bone and the cartilage. So, Katie, and when we do ACDFs, you can, remember we take the cartilage off, 
with the big curette, that takes out most of the collagen, and then we get just to the subcondylar bone where it starts to bleed. So we see that during the surgery with the microscope, right? The inner part, you can see a jelly donut. People say it's like a jelly donut is, is soft and gelatinous, and the outer part is thick. The outer part resists um, uh, tension forces. The inner part, nucleus pulposus, resists axial forces. Uh, again, the disc has no blood supply, um, and, um, and that's important. So this is the, the blood vessels in the vertebral body. In the middle of the vertebral body, there's a really big basilar vein, and on the end plates, that's, that's, there's a capillary network that feeds the disc. So here's the capillary network up against the disc, and the disc is fed nutrition through osmosis, basically. Um, the discs make up a quarter of our height. So just like, I mean, I've lost, have you lost any height? I've lost an inch, at least probably. I haven't, I stopped measuring because I'm scared. I don't lose anymore. But there is a, there is a say that actually by the age 60, you lose about up to two inches in height. Yeah. You know. As mostly from the disc. Yeah. Probably. Mostly it's all this. Yeah. Maybe some cut those, but mostly discs. So our discs, a lot, most people, the discs flatten, and that's why old people are shorter than young people. And it's the largest avascular structure in the body. The outer part of the disc is, uh, it's a, it's a um, very thick um, lamellar network of collagen fibrils at 30 degrees to each other. So I'm going to, I'm going to explain this to you why. So if you, if you slice the disc, it's in concentric layers of these collagen fibrils at 30 degrees. It's it, like in a herringbone pattern. This is a herringbone jacket that I have in my closet. I don't wear anymore. So a herring, you can see the herring, the fish, and then the bones. And that's why they call it herring bone pattern. And this is under the microscope. You can see how the, the, um, the collagen fibrils are at 30 degrees to each other, and it gives it makes the discs really, really strong. So like in surgery, Katie, is it easy for me to put my, my pituitary in the disc? No, it's, not. it's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. And that's why, because these fibrils are at 30 degrees, it makes it really strong. So a couple more things about the disc. This is a rabbit disc where they where they stain the pain fibers. So you can see that the outer part of the disc is very richly innervated with nerve, and the middle is not. And this is important because you, um, as a clinician, you can get like a 30-year-old plumber, and he could barely move because of his back pain. I mean, he's like, he, he thinks he's going to die. It's so painful. And it is very painful because the the annulus is very richly innervated, and it's extremely painful. Um, but usually these annular injuries, they go away. But it, that tells you why it's just so painful for these people. The, the, the annulus is really richly innervated. And this is, this is a very important thing to understand is the load of the disc at different um, positions. So this is from Nockinson's study in like 1970. It was in medical students, actually. He had medical students change their position with a needle in the spine to see the pressure. And you can see when you lay down, that's the lowest pressure in the disc. And very interestingly, when you stand, there's not that much, there's not that much um, pressure on the disc. And you can see sitting has more pressure than standing. So that's why patients with disc disease say, it's worse when I sit. And patient, people that sit all day have the worst pain. And you can see if you sit with a bad posture with weights, that's the most pressure on your disc. That's why standing um, desks are better for people with back problems than sitting desks. So anybody want to add anything? Okay. So this is a, so do herniated discs heal? Uh, and Walter already told us yes. And this is my theory of how they heal. So let's say you took a person and you cut them in half with a magical knife and then you laid them down. And then you looked at the disc. And let's magnify that. So here's the disc. The top is the abdomen, the bottom is the back, and you can see the nerve roots. So the discs can herniate, they can herniate in the front. But if that happens, Katie, do the patients have, what, what kind of symptoms would they have if you have a disc herniation in the front of the disc, anterior? Like back pain, right? Right. Like low back pain. Right. But no, 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 right, no neurological compression because it's not where the nerves are. Or you can, herniate on the, very, on the side, but that's not going to give you leg pain either, and usually that heals without surgery. It, it gets better. But the, 
where the discs causes the most problems neurologically is posterior lateral, and it can hit the discs. So my theory is that once the nucleus pulposus leaves the annulus area into the nerve roots, the nucleus pulposus has uh, chemical mediators like cytokines, and they basically recruit uh, vascular uh, invagination of the disc herniation. So when I first started practicing, um, there was a nail with a very large disc, and I just couldn't get to the surgery until like two months later. I go into surgery, there's no disc. It's gone. And where the disc used to be was blood vessels. The patient still had symptoms, and I searched for an hour. I was like, oh, my God, am I on the wrong level? Do I know where it is? No, what happened is the disc was gone. And what happens, I think, is blood vessels slowly surround the disc herniation, and then through the blood vessels, the phagocytes exit the blood vessels and basically eat the discs, and the disc goes away. So you've you've seen this right many times, right, Walter? Yeah. It is it is um, um, it is it is a diffusion of, of when you look to the nucleus pulposus compact um, and they it's highly pertinacious but it's a lot of water too. Um, so inflammation has the way to actually wash it, wash it out. One is just increased perfusion and that's what you see neovascularization increased perfusion. Um, and they usually go away. Yeah, sciatica usually goes away. Goes away. Yeah. Yeah, I think because the nerve. Yeah, that's it's a very good question. It's not only the neurological compression, something hitting the nerve, but also the nerve is inflamed. So I think the nerve is still inflamed. So you can also get a chemical neuritis. You can get a very small rent in the disc, no disc herniation, but the patient has terrible leg pain because the nerve. Uh, is inflamed from the chemical mediators. But those patients don't need surgery, they just need time. So, or NSAIDs. Or NSAIDs. But I think, my, me personally, I think everything that we do gives a patient more time that they heal the, to give the disc the chance to heal itself. So, okay, so this, like, and you get an MRI and the disc is gone. So it's, it's complete success, right? Like, success. So, so this is my question. Who who gets the credit for the disc going away? Is it like bed rest, like the woman who's bed rest? Is it traction? Uh, the, did the physical therapist make the disc herniation go away? Massage make it go away? Physical therapy made the disc herniation go away? Acupuncture, did that make the disc go away? The pain management doctor, does he get credit for the sciatica going away? The doctor, that's 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 Dr. Roche earlier in his career. Did Dr. Roche get huh? Does Dr. Roche get the credit? Does the surgeon get the credit? God get the credit? Uh, is it just time? Is it just time people heal themselves? Me personally, I think some percentage of patients, the phagocytes basically eat the disc and it goes away and people get better. So the question is, why do some people get better and some people don't? I mean, I, I don't know. Do you have any theories, uh, Walter? Why do? No, I, I, or can you predict? Can you predict who? We cannot predict it. The human variability is so immense. Um, I mean, there are factors of course. So you can play on factors like smoking, obesity, and everything else. You know, if you have somebody fit, uh, they usually have better op better outcomes. But um, it's close to impossible for me. You can't. You can't no, predict. You can't. Yeah. So I think you have to give everybody the chance, give it a little time, Definitely. see if you get, before you send them to the surgeon. Yeah. But some people do not get better. Okay, so, uh, hold on. So just, this is a normal disc at the bottom. You see how the bottom disc is well hydrated. Every single disc is hydrated, but you see the disc can lose its hydration and can bulge and become diseased. And most disc herniations are posterior lateral. I'm going to tell you why. In general, the load is, the load is 80% born by the disc and um, just for some anatomy at the level of just below the pedicle is the foramen the foramen holds a dorsal root ganglion so you can see hold on this is something else the dorsal root ganglion is just below the pedicle now when patients get disc herniations that compress the dorsal root ganglion like kind of in the foramen they're extremely painful so the reason is the dorsal root ganglion is where the nerve roots basically come together and there's pain substances there. And um, the patients have terrific pain, much more than usual. 
Now, why do you get posterior lateral disc herniations? The, the middle portion of the posterior longitudinal ligament is the thickest part. It just has to do with the stress. So a, um, a relative weak area is the posterior lateral portion of the disc. So that's why most of the disc herniations are posterior lateral. That's where the, the ligament is the weakest. Um, I just this is a, this is just another fact. This is from Bowden's article about patients. These are patients that had an MRI and never had back pain, and they're stratified by age: 20 to 39, 40 to 59, 60 to 80. And the columns are abnormalities in the MRI, either herniated discs, stenosis, bulging, or degenerative disc. And these patients never had back pain. And you can see it's very very common to have an abnormal MRI without ever having any symptoms. And as you get older, it's more, more likely. Um, not everybody, but when you hit 60 to 80, almost everybody has some kind of problem on the MRI. So most people have spine uh, uh, problems. So this is a normal disc, and as, as you get older, the disc loses its hydration. And these are the risk factors for degenerative disc disease, obesity, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, the same things that give you coronary artery disease give you disc disease, laborers, older people, and just familial. Um, this is just a car this is a cartoon showing where teenagers grow through the end plates, and you can get injuries there. Um, they, they, I, I included this slide just to explain how discs deteriorate, and you can see normal is grade one, abnormal grade five. I won't go into it, but you can see there's a continuum of how discs degenerate. They lose their their um, water content. Uh, it gets worse. The disc loses its height. The annulus bulges. And some people go eventually to bone-on-bone -bone degenerative disc disease. Um, and this is just another example. You see on the top, A is a normal disc, and the bottom is a uh, very degenerated disc. And Okay, so, so any questions about degenerative disc disease or discs or... Okay, I know I'm going fast, but so let's go over the surgery. So the, let's say you have a disc herniation, doesn't get better like this woman, two months, she goes for discectomy. I just want to show you how I do the surgery. So patient's prone, a small incision in the back. You get down to the spine. You see the facet, the lamina, the posterior spinous process. Now, in my mind, after doing this for a long time, I know exactly where the disc is. So that's the disc. So I know my head, okay, I got to get, and you know, when you're a good surgeon, is not, hand technical, it's your brain is the most powerful. I mean, you got to have some technical skills, but it's mostly your brain. So that's where the disc is, and I know the disc herniation is going to be right there in my head. I, I know where it is. Because if you don't know where it is, you can't get to it. You can't just guess. So you have to make a hole in the bone. And this is this is the hole in the bone. And, and I play a little game. I play with Katie sometimes. As I say, this is where I think it is. And I ask Katie, and she's like, you know, she's she gets, I, I bother her a lot, so she ignores me most of the time. But I make a little game. I was like, this is where my lamina is. And I don't want to take too much. And I don't want to make take too little because I waste time. And then I check myself. I was wrong. I was right. And over the years, I've gotten very, very good. I'm almost perfect every time because I've been training myself. So I guess, where is my laminotomy going to be? So I to guess. So you see how my laminotomy is curved? And it's not. And there's a reason. I'm going to tell you guys the reason. I, I just learned. Did you guys ever hear of the um, first commercial airliner in 1952. The first commercial airliner was British. It was called the DH-106 Comet. And uh, in the first year that it was commercial, three airplanes fell out of the sky, completely fell out of the sky. And they didn't know why. And they're like, I wonder if something's wrong with the airplane. So the airline industry was new. So they took all the debris and this is, this is how we started the Transportation Safety uh, Administration, looking at the crash data. And they found that the airliner had square windows, and the corner of the window was a stress riser. And the airplane was coming apart at the windows. And that's why all the windows now are oval, because a, a square is a relative stress riser in something that's under stress. So they had to read the... That's why all of our airlines, airline windows are around. So you can't, if you have a corner, that's a stress riser. So that's why whenever we cut things, it's better to be smooth and at an angle. It's less of a stress riser. And the stress riser I worry about 
is um, a pars fracture. You can see for the stars, if you get a crack across that area, it's a pars fracture. And we had yesterday's patient had a pars fracture. Yeah. So maybe maybe the uh, surgeon who did the previous surgery did not make a nice curve to his cut, or, or maybe it's just huh? Yeah, yeah, it's very common. Okay, so let's go back to the surgery. So we know what we want to do. We thin the bone, and then we take the pressure off the nerves. But then the question many patients say to me is like, how do you not injure the nerves? So I'm going to show you how. So here's the bone, and there's the nerves, and you want to decompress the nerves. And you do it with a burr, which, which is a very, very fat, uh, fast burr. It's like 20,000 cycles per second or something. So you thin the bone, and you're under a microscope, and you go thinner, thinner, now really thin. Mm -hmm. And you can tell, Katie, when I get really thin, I push a little bit. I can see it moves a little bit. Yeah, so it's so, th yeah, it's it's so thin that I, I can push it, and I can tell it's almost there under the microscope. So then once you get super thin, you take a little curette, and you basically lift the last portion off the nerves. And in that way, it's very safe. Um, okay, so here's our disc herniation. We, we expose the disc herniation. We pull the nerve roots aside just a little bit, not a lot because we don't want to injure the nerve. And what I do, what I never do is I never ask you to hold a nerve. And the, the standard thing in spine surgery is have your assistant hold the nerve. The benefit is that you can move fast because you can see the disc and somebody has taken care of it. But I never do it because the assistant can pull the nerve too much and injure the nerve. So basically, I pack it off with a patty. Uh, and do the right. least, yeah, the least amount of retraction possible so that you can get a neuropathy. So you uh, you expose the disc herniation and use a pituitary to remove it. Now sometimes, sometimes when you take out a disc herniation or stenosis, the stenosis has been there for so long the dura remains deformed. Well, it usually goes back to its normal position, but sometimes the deformity persists. It, 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 um, it's just something you see sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so we did the discectomy. So just the, the patient has to be in the prone position, usually on an operating room table for spine so the belly's free, um, so the IVC is not compressed and you don't get um, uh, bleeding. We use a C-arm to localize our level and a microscope to magnify everything. So the microscope stays over the patient, um, magnifies up to uh, over 10 times. I think this goes up to 14 times. We usually work around five times. The instruments we use are just a knife to get started, electric cartery for bleeders. Some people use a tube. I usually use this Taylor retractor because it's just easier and faster. I use a pla plastic sucker. You're going to see why I use a plastic sucker because it's it's soft and it won't injure the nerves. The typical sucker, sucker for spine is a Fraser tip, which it's easier for use in the microscope. But I don't like it because it's hard, and I feel it's a higher likelihood to injure the nerve, so I use a soft one. The burr, this is a guy burring um, stone. The burr to remove the bone, here's a burr is for stone. The burr that I use is a Medtronic AM8. Uh, it's, um, it's round, and uh, it's pretty safe. Like you, can, you can touch the dura with that. Uh, you're not supposed to, but even if you do, you don't always get a dural tear because... The shape is perfect, so it, does, it only cuts hard things, not soft things. I mean, obviously, you'll get a dural tear if you hit it hard enough. And uh, the burr that I use is, is electrical. It's not gas. So it used to be high pressure, these high pressure gas hoses that were very, uh, they were not easy to use, actually. The, the, new, the newer ones, electrical, are much better. This is a kerosene punch that removes the extra bone. This is uh, Dr. Penfield. Uh, a neurosurgeon from Canada who created instruments for uh, neurosurgery. This is the Penfield 4. It's a, you'll see I'll, I'll use it during surgery. It's a it's a probe. It's very smooth and soft. I use it like constantly, right, Katie? This is the issue that I want to be buried with. Yeah, I want to be buried with the Penfield 4. <laughs> but, but now that I'm getting older, I don't like to joke around about death because it's getting close. <laughs> I used to say that. I don't say it anymore. So there's different types of Penfields. That's a Penfield three, different shapes, shapes and sizes. This is a Penfield one, like a cup. Uh, and I use these curettes, hollow handle curettes, so they're different sizes and shapes to uh, remove the extra bone. And a pituitary rondure, this is like a grabbing instrument. It was designed uh, for the brain, uh, but uh, most people use it for spine. So we get back to our case of the disc herniation. 
There's different types of disc herniation. There's bulging. The whole disc can bulge. You can get a slight protrusion. You can get an extrusion that uh, a piece comes out, a large piece, or you can get the disc can move up and down the canal and sequestrated uh, or basically it's disconnected from the disc too. Um, we're almost at the surgery. I just want to, I want to just, we're talking about disc herniations. This, I want to show you this, uh, Walter. This is the percentage of Medicare patients who are fused. So, I mean, I only do fusions for patients who have gross motion, like spondylolisthesis, a good amount. Um, the facets are very, very unstable, deformed. I usually don't fuse it unless patients, it's a third herniation, because it's harder to go back in with scar, scar, scar. It's a higher likelihood of a problem. But a lot of people just fuse, will fuse this patient de novo. And you can see across the country, the darker color is the percentage of fusions. So across the country, it's very common that everybody gets a fusion. Actually, in Baltimore, we're pretty good. We're not seeing Washington, Baltimore. We're not that bad. But there's some parts of the country that spine surgeons, everybody gets a fusion. Um, and then the, the last thing I, I, uh, I just want to um, go over is, is uh, some patients have sciatica and yet no findings on the MRI. So, um, I mean, I have a policy in normal MRI, no surgery. And, and there are things that can cause sciatica that are not amenable to surgeries. Uh, and people hate me uh, because I won't help them. They think I won't help them. But the only reason I don't help them is because the surgery is not going to work. Um, and it's no, nah, you can get away with it. People, the surgeons do it all the time. Operate on normal MRIs or mild, and um, it's it's really the wrong thing to do. So, and it's common. It's very, it is very common. Okay, so it's just these are just issues about this. So this is um, the last thing I want to discuss before the surgery. This. I have a friend who uh, is a, a medical doctor, and he sent me this article from the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, if something is published in New England Journal of Medicine, it usually means you should not do surgery. <laughs> but this this actually article says you should do surgery. It's like surgery does well. So this this and I sent it I sent it to you guys earlier. It's from March. It's March of this year. Surgery versus conservative uh, 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 care. It's a single center, random. Six months uh, follow-up using visual analog scale. So, at um, patients were randomized either surgery or no surgery for herniated discs from L4 to S1, and um, there was actually 34 percent crossover. So, some of the people who were non-operative said a third of those people said, "I want the surgery." Um, but anyway, at six months and 12 months, the patients who had surgery did much better than the patients that did not have surgery. So. So they gave everybody like um, they gave everybody some time. I think um, these were all patients that were seeking help from sciatica. Um, I forget it, it, it. They weren't like one week out. They uh, I think they had symptoms for two or three months though. They, so the patients that the patients who had surgery had less pain six to 12 months later than the patients did not have surgery. But a lot of people crossed over. But the patients said, and not operative treatments, like, I don't want this, I want the surgery. It was a third. But the patients that had surgery did better, the patients didn't. So, I mean, surgery works in these people. I always, I always tell them, you know, both, both therapeutic approach can take you to the same place. How, as long as there's no and so in early to compromise. But, you know, if you can't wait for a good selected patient, you know, with clear indication, the surgery will take you there quicker, you know. Uh, so it's a matter of time, uh, provided there's no neurological decline. Yeah. Um, now, the, the other issue, of course, is that uh, the tendency, the human tendency of, uh, of getting things fixed, you know, and delayed notification. Um, and then tell somebody, listen, I, I projected in six months you're going to be here. But if this thing is just destroying your lifestyle and the things that they, they live in, you can't even put your shoes on, have the surgery. If you, you're going to make the change, they get better quickly. But both of them will get you there in the same place, provided there's no ensuing 
little bit compromised. When you have somebody that actually is declining functionally, as uh, Dr. Abraham mentioned, you know, you actually improve way better with a uh, surgery because you can't, you get, you got to see the, the, uh, the long-term problem. If the patient is over 40, 50, 60, the recovery, the, the, the probability for neural recovery goes down. So the faster you move, the better outcomes, the better prognosis. Um, and that's, as long as they understand that, you know, it, it, it takes you the same way. But uh, there's no substitution for good patient selection. Yeah. Yeah, but I want to sort. I want to go back to what you said. Is like people want things fixed, and also people cannot stand uncertainty. Yeah, they like, ah, oh, yeah. I gotta wait. Like, I can't. I just, I just want it fixed. Yeah. Like they can't deal with the uncertainty that you may not get better. You may, you know, and some patients just they, they just psychologically they can't deal with it. Did you put all the stuff on the table? They pretty much. Do you facilitate the decision making for the patient? And I thought, listen, you'll be fine either way, but. You know, you don't be paranoid that this is going to fill up every now and then. It's going to fix. Right. And you get there. Okay. So uh, this is a surgery. So. Okay. So. Uh, so you guys understand what you're looking at. That's a Taylor retractor. The top part. Uh, towards the ceiling is the medial or the midline, the posterior spinous process. Lateral is the tailor. To the left is the patient's foot or the butt, and to the right is the patient's head. So this is just the exposure. I, I use the electric artery um, to stop the bleeders. That's the lamina. The bottom part is the facet. So you want to be careful. So now I'm making my burst. So see how I, I'm kind of stopped there? I'm guessing. And I'm, I'm probably talking to Katie. I'm like, this is where I'm going to go. And I always ask Katie because uh, I don't know. I always ask her. So see how it's kind of rounded? And, uh, and I'm thinning the bone with the high-speed burr. And the, the, on the left is a sucker tip, which is plastic. And I usually do this myself. Not that Katie's not a good assistant, but it's just faster. And I feel, I can feel with the sucker tips. I get proprioceptive information. I can tell I just got through there. I can feel soft ligament. And the ligament, the ligament of flavor protects you from the dura, if you have, especially if you have thick ligament. So <laughs> I just keep going with my laminotomy. And I enter the spinal canal at the very top where the ligament of flavum ends. And I can usually tell when I'm there because it has a tendency to bleed a lot, more than the thick part. You see how it's bleeding at the top? So I know I'm close now. I, I know I'm close to where I should be there, so I have to be careful now there. Um, I usually put some wax on it. You know, put some, I, I use wax for hemostasis. There's a little bit of wax. So I kind of know I'm close to where I want to be probably. So this is a kerosin punch. The, the kerosin lifts the very last portion of the bone away from the dura uh, to expose the dura at the top. I usually expose the dura at the top. So this is the kerosin punch that I showed you guys earlier. It removes the bone. So that's the, the dura is not exposed yet because the ligament and flavum is still there. So I, I can see the uh, dura, so I take a curette and <coughs> I gently lift the ligamentum flavum off the dura. And the curette's curved, so it's very safe. Uh, so I'm just gently lifting the ligamentum flavum off the dura to expose the nerve roots. And then once it's loose, and I'm not sure it's not um, uh, adherent to anything, I take the kerosene to remove the ligamentum flavum. And you see a little fat there at the top. That's the fat is the covering of the dura. There's always a little bit of fat above the dura. Some more than others. Some patients have a lot of fat, and then that can be a problem too. Okay, so now the nerves are exposed, and now I'm packing off the dura to expose the disc. And I use a little cottonoid patty with the Penfield 4, and you see the nerves there on the top? That's the dura and the nerve root. That's the L5. Let's see, uh, it would be the S1 nerve root. And uh, 
the, the spinal canal has blood vessels because it's trying to heal this thing. So you, the uh, cottonoid patty, not only does it push the dura over, it also stops the bleeding by pressure on the epidural vessels. I don't like using electric artery for the epidural vessels. I try to limit the electric artery as much as possible because I feel it can scar the nerves. So you can see the nerve roots very clear. And you can see I have a little working window. So I make, I make my window just big enough to fit the pituitary, no more than that. And now I'm going underneath the nerve to find the disc herniation. And you can see it, it peaks out actually, you'll be able to see in one second. Because what you're seeing now is the annulus, but you can, you can see a little bit of nucleus pulposus, it has a different color to it. The annulus is smooth, you see it right there? That's the nucleus pulposus sticking out, the disc a piece of the disc herniation. See, there's a rent, there's a rent in the, uh, in the uh, annulus. Now, I usually do not use a knife to cut the annulus if I don't have to, but this is a really big disc, so that's the knife. I just cut just just a, just a hole, just to make a little hole. I don't make a big window, just enough to put the pituitary in. And I don't always use the knife to cut the annulus, just to limit trauma. And, and that's the pituitary, and now I'm removing the disc material. And I'm just, I'm just putting it into the disc space. And this is going through the annulus to remove the nucleus pulposus portion. So the, the pituitary is uh, round and it makes it very smooth so you don't injure the nerve root. So you'll see the, I'm taking the fragment, I usually take the fragment out very slowly so I don't tear the dura or injure the nerve root. You can see how I retract with the sucker. And I'm just, that's a Penfield 4. I'm the, now I'm just gently, gently removing the disc away from the nerve roots. You can see very big disc fragment. And, and that, that's Katie's favorite part of the case. Yeah. So this, this nucleus pulposus was compressing the nerves. I can yeah. just feel the relief yeah. that the patient's going to have. Okay, so I removed all the discs. This is the very end. I usually irrigate the disc space with a, a pediatric suction, a pediatric feeding tube. So this is a, it's a tiny tube that they put in baby's noses. So it's a very, very small tube. I put that tube into the disc space. You see the tube? I'm sticking it into the disc space to irrigate the disc space. And um, the reason why I do this usually is um, the disc is an avascular structure, so it can get infected. So I want to irrigate it just to clean it. And also this brings out more disc material sometimes, anything that's loose. So you see the, that's a pediatric uh, feeding catheter. I usually push it into about five centimeters. I'm looking at the number. And then Katie pushes the fluid. And you see it's bringing out more disc material. Usually we do like 100 cc's. We irrigate it with 100 cc's just to remove any loose disc fragments. So that's it. I always thought that the nucleus pulposus was more more like gel. It can it can be yeah. it, it can be very watery, yeah. but usually not. Like if you let's say you do acute discs, like mm -hmm. let's say somebody calls Tanya and they have sciatica for seven days, I put them on the schedule right away, and I take the disc out. It's very water filled. I don't see those patients because I just don't do surgery on them. Mm -hmm because they get better. I have done it in the past for specific mm -hmm. cases where, you know, the disc was huge, called aquinas syndrome, patient couldn't walk, you know. But usually my patients are more degenerative like this, but they can be like that. It's almost like um, a piece of crumble egg. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. well, I usually tell patients crab meat. It looks a little, yeah, like, a little bit like crab meat. Oh, that's very embarrassing. That's not going to work, though. That's not going to work. What do you mean? The whole thing? Or the yeah. surgery? Or just the, the whole surgery. work? That's a lot. We should see what I did yesterday. And that's, this is nothing. <laughs> that's a lot of work. The revision, the revision lumbar cases, like multi-levels, those are, those are a lot of work. A lot of steps. Yeah.
our programs, our, our programs autobiography in the lab of food. No, there's a there's a lot it's that goes into it, yeah. And also and also if you're experienced, it helps a lot. I only say this because I'm experienced now. <laughs> yeah, when I was younger, I'd say you don't need experience. You just need skill. But now that I'm older, experience helps a lot. And there's many things that you can go wrong. Many things. And, and, and as you get older, you know, and you're like, you're calm. It doesn't stress you out. You know what to avoid. It, I'll tell you, I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a way simpler than that, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of and um, labor intensive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's labor intensive. Wow. So, what else, so, what are the questions you have, like disc herniation? Anybody? Or comments? I have a question, but yeah. it's not related to something. Go ahead. I have a friend, he's had a back surgery, and he was born with a reverse hernia. And he said that the reverse Yeah, that's common. That is common? Yeah. They were saying that it was a uh, the disc herniation? Well, the, the devil's in the details and something like that. I have to see exactly what's going on. I mean, it's like, it, uh, having anomalies of the spine is very common. Like, people, not everybody is like a textbook. So it is very, I mean, it, when they looked at army recruits and the leg lengths of army recruits, I think only like 10% or something, a very small percent were perfect. Like age, both legs were the same. So we're off, everything's just off a little bit if you look at the microscope. So uh, any other uh, comments on this? Did I miss anything, Walter? No, that's a very comprehensive one. You want to everything. Everything. That's impressive. All right. Katie, did you learn anything today? Nothing? I don't know. We just did one yesterday. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. See All right. <laughs> well, at least it was good to review. All right. Thanks, everybody. Impressive. impressive, impressive. Thanks for coming. Impressive.